All right, good morning. Welcome to Oak Bridge Community Church. No matter where you're at, if you're watching online, we want to welcome you, which I'm assuming most people are, no matter where you're at in your house, uh, maybe you're on vacation on the road. And then for those of you that are in this room, we are glad that you're here. I can tell you, I am, I am super excited for the series that we start today. Um, it's a series called um, Someone Has to Say It. And, you know, in the Bible and in Christianity and in, in many of the words of Jesus, there are some tough truths. Some things that, that are just uh, hard to grapple with, hard to accept sometimes, and we are going to dive into that a lot. And I know Tom's got a great message for us this morning starting off with that. Um, but before we even get into the service, we're going to show a video. And I think it kind of fits in a little bit with the series that we're going to go into, and it's called Words. And I just, as I watch the video, I want you to think of, of one word as you're watching this. And, and that word to me was just intentionality. And um, you'll kind of see, and I'll, I'll come up afterwards and explain a little bit, but if we could watch the screen and at home, you're going to be watching this video with us. You don't have a ton of things in common with God, but there is one thing. You speak. So does he. God spoke light into existence with his words. I wonder what you could speak into existence with your words this week. I wonder what kind of love you could speak into your marriage that feels like it's in neutral. I wonder what kind of courage you could speak into the heart of a child who's hurting. I wonder what kind of peace you could speak into your broken friendship. What kind of hope you could speak into your own weary soul. I want you to know that the most powerful words you're gonna speak this week is probably not gonna be on a stage or a conference call or closing the deal with a client that you want. The most powerful words you're gonna speak is probably just with one or two people listening, maybe zero. It's totally possible that the most powerful sentence you'll say this week is a thoughtful text message that you send to a friend who's walking through the valley of the shadow of death. It's the apology email that you finally get the courage to send it's the whispered prayers through tears in the middle of a dark night. Powerful words aren't just for preachers who stand behind pulpits. They're for parents who stand next to bunk beds. Speak life with their kids, for spouses who share hopes and dreams during pillow talk, and not criticism. For teenagers who stand up to bullies, stand up for the uncool kids. Your tongue is so small, but so powerful. Your tongue is telling a story. You know, again, I would say we don't just drift into a life that's meaningful. We don't just drift into good relationships. We don't just drift into to, to meaningful conversations. And, and as I was watching that video, I mean, as a parent, as a spouse, it's just a believer in Jesus Christ that wants people to know um, the king of the universe. I, I just wonder how intentional we are about our day. Or do we just drift? You know, do, do, do we develop friendships, or, and again, in our family relationships, the conversations that we have, um, are, are, we, are we trying to center them around Christ and what he's done in our life and what he can do for other people? Because make no mistake, if we're a Christ follower, the call is for us to go out and make other disciples. Everything that we do is to be rooted in the great commission to go out and make disciples of all nations, to baptize them and to teach them to, to obey everything that Christ has commanded. And I just wonder... Does that really, the words that we use, the conversations that we have, is that really our focus? Is that what's guiding us? Is that what's, uh, you know, moving us forward? Are we thinking of that in our daily lives? Or do we just drift? Talk about the weather, talk about politics, whatever it is. And, and, and I just wonder, and I know my own life, that video there was just a, a reminder of just the, the importance of words of what we say, of the conversations that we do have or that we don't have. So there's a scripture that came to mind. Again, as I was watching that, it's from 1 Peter 3.15. It says, in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared. Always be prepared. In other words, be intentional. Be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Not as idiots, 
not as, as people that are shouting down other people that think that they're better, but, but make no mistake, the, the idea is, is to be ready to give the reason for the hope that we have, to speak about Jesus Christ, to point other people to them. So I, I want to give you a little time um, on your own, no matter where you're at, just take some time and, and, and maybe think about that. How intentional are you in your lives about pointing people towards Jesus, about, about, about making your speech, your words about loving God and loving other people and fulfilling the great commission, the great commandments that God has given to us. So take some time just on your own, go to God in prayer, and then I'll pray for us. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning, and, and, and maybe I'm not speaking for everyone, but for myself, God, I, I ask for forgiveness, and I, and I pray that, that you'll help me to understand uh, the depth, the reality, of, and the truth of, of your words that, that we have recorded for us in Scripture, Father, that tell us that, that life is all about you, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and yet so often, God, my life becomes about me and my agenda. So, Father, help me to refocus. Help me to understand the conversations I have, the words that I speak, that they are to bring life, that they are to to be loving, gentle, respectful, but also bold and truthful, God. So help us as Christians to be focused on on the truth and the the reality of this world, that life is fleeting, that there is a Savior that loves us, and, and people need a Savior, God. So help us in that and, and help us to, to always be ready to give the reason for the hope that lies within, which, which really should convict us, Father, and, and, and help us all to look at ourselves and to think, do we really live out that hope that we profess? And so, Father, we are grateful for Jesus. I'm grateful for the forgiveness and for the grace that he offers that good news. And, Father, we just thank you for your love that is always on us and for the truth of your word. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Awesome. You guys got some coming up here and uh wow, making yeah. some announcements. Yeah, here. we have a uh, Who are you? We have a few announcements. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here and who are you? I'm Tom and I'm also one of the pastors. Nice. Here. You want to get us started? I'm the best looking of the pastors here. <laughs> Beyond that, no. Yeah. I'm going to throw it right back to you. Um, I just prayed for forgiveness. <laughs> uh, you ought to. Mm-hmm. Um <laughs> What do you want me to start with? Uh, I was thinking you could start. I could. Okay, then yeah. I'll start. Then I just want to say hello to everybody, like Kirk said earlier, that's watching online, no matter where you're at. Just so people need to know, we normally have between 1,000 and 2,000 people that watch online from 12 different states. Obviously, primarily uh, 95% of it in, in Missouri, and uh, about 50-50 Jefferson County and St. Louis County, and uh, a little bit of the St. Louis City. So uh, we just welcome you all here and hope that God touches you the same way that he does for the uh, 40 or so people that are in this room right now. And uh, I wanted to give kind of a quick update about the church. Our goal originally, when we had set goals uh, about church attendance and when we could get back together three or four months ago, was to watch Cardinal Baseball. And if the fans were allowed to go to Cardinal Baseball, that was a green light, so we were going to open up then. And the second benchmark that we had was back to school. And if back to school came in and they didn't have any school problems, then that was a green light. And now we see where half the schools aren't open and they're not coming back. So we haven't exact, exactly gotten total clarity in <laughs> no, the matter uh-uh, here. Uh-uh. Uh-huh. And we've still been praying to God, obviously, the promptings of God, but we're trying to be wise and safe and, and, uh, and, and, and move according to the spirit and wisdom as well. So with that said, realistically, we're going to watch during the month of August and reevaluate in September. Uh, the goal of August 23rd, I don't think it makes sense right now with the COVID breakout, what we have in, in St. Louis and what schools are doing right now. So we're going to kind of watch that a little bit and come back. So just so you know, uh, we're excited about that. But with that said, we've, uh, we had a uh, worship night that got rained out the other night, and it'll be rescheduled sometime this month, so we, an outdoor concert. It's going to be phenomenal. We saw the stage and everything. So we'll let you know about that via Facebook, online, website, Instagram, and so forth. And you guys have something planned. Yeah. Tell me about it. Yeah, so we made an announcement last week that we scratched on Friday. So we announced that we were going to have Big Stuff Live up here on Monday, Tuesday, 
and Wednesday night. Um, you actually see that slide behind us. We are no longer going to have Big Stuff Live, so we can take that slide down, actually. <laughs> uh, so we are not going to have Big Stuff Live for those three evenings. Really do, again, to the new restrictions and with kids potentially going virtual and just trying to make the best decision. I don't know. Uh, goodness gracious. So we are, we are, we're not going to have that, but on Tuesday night, we are going to have a movie night out on the parking lot. And so we have a massive screen out there. Wait, 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 uh, wait. I painted the 30 foot by 30 foot white screen on the side wall. Did you? I did. It looks really good. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. He climbed up and down a ladder several times and couldn't walk the next I day. Couldn't but walk. That was okay. right. Literally. For yeah. sure. For sure. I don't believe that one for he a did. second. Huh? No, he did. You painted that? I yes. painted it. I couldn't yes. walk yes. the second day. I'm Are you serious? serious? I, yes, I've got did. butt muscles. It was that real I didn't smart. Know he had hip replacement surgery, and I'm like, do you want to go up there? And he's like, yeah, I can do it. I'm like, have at yeah. it then, man. Wow. Go for well, it. Those muscles yeah. have been asleep for I'm 40 so years. I'm so sorry. All right, go ahead. I, so I, anyway, go ahead. I underestimated Now, you. we have our 20-something uh, pastor that didn't know that that was getting painted. No, no, no he knew. Yeah. He, he knew. He was just golfing. Yeah, go ahead. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I did not know about the paint. Um, so, anyways, we are going to go watch a movie on Tom's painted screen, which makes me wonder if it's going to be worth watching. <laughs> okay, okay. No, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> hold on. So, you're not going to name the screen, but what, what time can they show up for that uh, night? They can, they can show up. It's good. At 8 p.m. 8 p.m. on Tuesday night. The movie's going to start at 8:30. Uh, so well, let, 8 o'clock. Let, 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 let me give them 7:30 because I'm going to add something to that. I say you didn't know this, but I'm going to add to that. No, I didn't know it. So we're yep, you got it. Okay, oh, yeah. so at 7:30 they can show up for the movie on Tuesday night. Sweet. Okay, and uh, uh, we've got these T-shirts that they can buy. But oh, that was part of the reason here, for 8 o'clock. They still have plenty of well, time. Well, I'm showing you this. That's okay. it. So at 7.30. I you guess he's expecting these Hope, a long line Hope for these T-shirts. Hope wins T-shirts. This is what we're feeling right now during COVID-19, <laughs> that Hope wins. When people ask me, what do you think about COVID-19? I said, here's the bottom line. Hope wins. Hope will win. So there's one. Kayla's got a second one. And then there's one more, Kayla. There's a third one. And you can one. show a third one. They're 10 bucks. 100 percent they're regularly 15. Kayla, could you slip that on? No, no. 100 <laughs> percent of the proceeds are going to go to the Arnold Food Pantry, who's asked for our help. 100 percent. So 10 bucks is for the T-shirt, and we're giving 10 bucks to Arnold Food Pantry. It's all every yep. we're losing money on these. We're right. taking the hit on them and giving them all to our Arnold Food Pantry. So nice. But there, but then there's a challenge that I got here. So you got Tuesday night, which will be most of the students coming up for that movie night at 7:30. Yeah. And I'm asking them to bring some canned goods. I don't care if it's one can of green beans or, you know, whatever, but bring some canned goods up. Then I want to see how many they bring up. That night, we're going to donate those, obviously, to the Arnold Food Pantry. Then uh, Wednesday night, I decided, you know what? And the screen, by the way, looks fabulous. We came up here and saw it. It looks like a high-def TV. You're not going to believe it. It, it really does look good. It is. You're it not going to believe it. How would you know? You didn't even know it was I, there. I, I showed him a picture of it, okay. but, but let it's me finish. On the, it's right where I parked. Okay. Right. It looks yeah. amazing. So the next thing is we're showing Secret Lights of Pets 2, all right? I know it's great. My seven-year-old grandson says it's phenomenal. So you can come up, and we're going to provide all the popcorn. The weather's supposed to be perfect is why I decided to make this movie week, okay? Then all you have to do to come up is bring a canned good. So I want to see if Secret Lights of Pets 2, families, kind of, versus teenagers, who brings the most canned goods. Then the third night, I thought, you know what? There's a great movie, and it is a great movie. It's Dennis Quaid, Priscilla Shire, and it's called I Can Only Imagine. We're showing that Thursday night. And it is a fun, if you haven't seen it, or if you've seen it again, go watch it. It is a great night. So that age group, I want to see how many canned goods you bring up. All those canned goods, where they're going to have them brought over to Arnold Food Pantry, and we're going to hopefully that we can bless them. So Tuesday night at 7.30, you can be here. Wednesday night at 7.30, you can be here. Thursday night at 7.30, you can be but, here. But the movies will all start right around 8.15. I saw where it's supposed to get dark, around 8.10. So... Okay, so, but you said come up here. We're talking Tuesday night students. That's kids going seventh grade up through seniors. Yeah, Tuesday night would be right? the one night we'd probably not have you come up. Yeah, then, right. then Wednesday night would be a family because it's a little kid, and then Thursday night. Right. I'm or just trying to clarify here. Yeah, yeah. that's okay. beautiful. Yeah. Secret Life Pets 2 on Wednesday, Thursday, Tuesday, we don't know yet, right? It's right. amazing. I think that's all we got, right? Are we ready to sing? I think we're <laughs> we're ready to play. You're ready to sing here. Josh, lead us in the music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're excited. We're, we have our Oak Bridge City team here this morning, which we're excited uh, to be led in worship. 
We have three amazing uh, worship songs. So we have a few people in the room. We'd encourage you to lean in. And if you're at your house, I want to challenge you to lean in as well, to sing, to at least honor God with your thoughts as you pay attention to these beautiful lyrics. And I know the temptation when you're sitting on your couch, like, well, you know, it's just kind of, it's just different. It's not the same. It, it doesn't feel the same. I don't get as much out of it, whatever you want to say. But I want to challenge you with this thought. What if your worship this morning wasn't about you at all? What if it was about Christ? Like, 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 what if it wasn't about how you feel when you're on your couch or this or that, but what if it's about how you could honor God and worship God because he's worthy of everything that you have, no matter where you're at, which we believe that he is. And so we have some beautiful, beautiful songs and an amazing opportunity to remember the greatest message of all time. And so I would encourage you, wherever you're at, to join us in that. So if you're in the room, why don't you stand up? If you're at home, let's lean in and go to God together. Cross is my beginning. The line drawn in the sand. The end of all my striving. Now I'm born again. There Jesus was forsaken. So I will never be And His grace is my salvation The gift of God The work of Calvary It is done It is finished Christ has won He is risen Grace is here, love has triumphed over death forever. The cross needs no addition, His mercy is complete. His love is not in question. The Son of God has spoken over me. It is done. It is finished. Christ has won. He is risen. Grace is here. Love has tried.
question of the measure of his love. Our chains are gone, and our debt is paid. The cross has overthrown the grave for Jesus. That sets us free Means death to death And life for me The innocent judged guilty While the guilty one walks free And death would be his portion song and it's really just a, a song of praise and so I just encourage you to lean in in this moment and just bring God your all bring God your your praise uh, and there's amazing things that happens in the heart when we can forget about ourselves for just a little bit and just focus our attention on the goodness of God and bring him the glory and praise that he deserves so let's sing this together What gift of love could I offer to a king? What weight of worth could be held within my offering? When he alone is worthy A glory song Inscribed upon my heart This treasure held in an alabaster jar I break To bring him all the 
Sacrifice could be equal to His own. The cross of Christ has declared that there is not I own. Yet I know I owe Him more. Praise God from whom all blessings. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Would you all pray with me? Heavenly Father, we praise your name. We thank you for your goodness and your love that you pour out each and every day uh, on us. And we praise you for that and we thank you. And we realize that there is nothing we can do to earn that love, to earn the grace that you've given us. But it's only because of who you are and your goodness that you've brought us to yourself, that you've covered our sin, that you've justified us before you. And so we praise you for that. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. You guys can take a seat. Well, Oak Bridge City, what a band, huh? That was a great time of worship. I hope you're not... Uh, our room enjoyed it. Hopefully, wherever you're at, you enjoyed it as well, and hopefully, more than more importantly, that God was praised by it. But um, we start this new series today called Someone Has to Say It. We're going to be in it for the next approximately four to five weeks. Uh, all the pastors are going to speak during this time period. Josh steps up to bat. Uh, next week, and he's already told me what he's going to talk about, and it's going to be 
I think, a bit controversial, so I'm anxious to see that. Um, this whole series, I think, is going to say some things that will step on some of our toes, step on some of the, the toes of the church, and step on some of the toes of a culture as well. Someone has to say it. Here's what that kind of is about. Six of you are around a dinner table, and you've all had salads, and one person has a big piece of lettuce stuck in their tooth. Doesn't someone just have to say it? I mean, isn't that, hey, you got a little right there? You just got to say it. You can't sit there and go the rest of the meal without looking at it. You just have to say it. Friends come over. They have three little kids. We'd call them three little rug rats. You've got the carpets. They've just been cleaned. They've been vacuumed, and they're nice. And one little kid is running around, and you notice he's got just a little mud on his tennis shoes. And every little place he pivots, there leaves a little mud there. You watch this go on until you start to see your tan carpet turning a little bit brown. And finally, someone just has to say it. Hey, he's got mud on his shoes, right? Somebody just has to say it. All the kids are in the front room rustling. They're roughhousing, playing around. Finally, finally, somebody just has to say it. Stop it before somebody gets hurt. Stop it before somebody gets hurt. Now, this is for all the wives. Someone's telling a story wrong. Their facts are off just a little bit. It's an inaccurate memory, a wrong place, a wrong time. There's a wrong person. And it's your husband saying it. Somebody just got to say what? You're wrong. That's my wife's job. She says that she just can't let it go. It was off a little bit. Somebody just has to say it. There are some things that you just say to yourself, you know what? Someone just has to say it. So with Josh and Herc, we said, look, are there some things right now that we just have to say? that need to be spoken to the lives of our church, everybody that's watching online, if you're new today, then join in, because we're trying to step on all of us, we're, and, and encourage as well, so it's just not a, a beat-down session, it's a, it's a truth session, and hopefully an encouragement session, and a make-us-better session, and a make our, our church better and our community better session, but you just got to say it at times. So here we go. Part one, someone has to say it. In high school, um, I took an elective class. I didn't really like math, and I didn't really like science, and I didn't really like English. <laughs> so I ended up finding myself taking uh, electives. That's when they allowed it. I really took my last math class and my last science class my freshman year of high school. So they had a class offered, and it was on archaeology. Now, most of the people took it in that class because they knew the teacher, and it was considered a blow-off class. The teacher didn't care about archaeology. The teacher wasn't an archaeologist. It was just a class that... They taught, he taught, according to the book. But I cared about archaeology. Actually, at that time period, you wouldn't know this, but I wanted to be an archaeologist. It's a true story. Now, I know what you're thinking, you know, bookworm. No, think more like Indiana Jones. That's, that would be more like the uh, archaeologist. But I, I cared about archaeology. I wanted to be an archaeologist. I tell you some things that fascinated me. The Egyptian culture fascinated me. I mean, 4,500 years ago, a guy's at the height of his power, young, young to middle-aged, young, and he starts building a pyramid thinking about the next life. He's in this life right now, but he's so confident in the next life, they build these pyramids. That's where he's going to house himself. That's where he's going to house his treasures and so forth. I was fascinated by that. Thinking, boy, this guy's uh, so aware, so true of the afterlife that they're building this stuff while they're alive. Then I looked at ancient Greece and Rome about the same time period. And they were also concerned about the afterlife. They believed the soul went somewhere. They believed there were three places it went. I don't have time to go to it. But two of them were bad and one of them was really good. So they would try and bury their gems with them and their valuable jewelry as a way to bribe whoever it was that brought their soul to wherever it could go, one of those three places. And uh, so the ancient uh, Greeks and the Romans, they believed there was an afterlife. It made sense there's this life and there's another life after this life ends. China, 3,500 years ago. Get this one. This is brutal, but it's true. Uh, they've uncovered, due to archaeology, uh, tombs. And the Chinese elite, uh, mausoleums as well, would have their servants often buried with them when they died. But their servants were alive. So they would entomb them while they were alive with the dead person that brought them with them. Crazy. But they see the bone structure. They see where they're buried and where they moved in that. Well, then, that's 3,500 years ago. Well, then, uh, roughly 2,200 years ago, the Chinese culture got a bit more civilized. 
and they decided, well, instead of burying live people with us or killing people and burying them with them, we'll just make uh, clay figurines of them. And you've seen this, haven't you, before? The Terracotta Warriors. I got a picture of it if you want to watch this and see this. Look at this picture of a tomb, a mausoleum, and they buried it with Terracotta Warriors. Show the next one. This is a mausoleum for the per first emperor of China. He, when he was buried, he was buried with these. Get this, 8,000 life-size soldiers, 130 realistic-sized chariots, and over 500 life-size horses were buried with this guy to take them into the next life. Now, that's something, isn't it? Think about that, how big the mausoleum was, how this guy had to prepare for it, and said, that's where we're going. The Vikings, according to archaeology, believed in the next life. African tribes, Indian tribes, they believed in the next life. We can't almost find any culture, current or past, that did not believe that this life, when it ended, there was another life to go to. And Solomon, over 3,000 years ago, the wise Solomon, that we mentioned a little bit in last week's message, in Ecclesiastes 3.11, here's what he says. Talking about God. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to end. In other words, people have it inside themselves where they know there's an eternity. They know that there's something more than just this. Don't you kind of scratch your head? And if you're a person that's not sure about it, I'm going to tell from my angle. Don't you kind of scratch your head when you see somebody and you say, they don't believe there's something after this? I mean, isn't that kind of a sad feeling? Like, you know, just boom, your worm food, boom, your dust, boom, it's just over. That's just not in the heart of most people. I mean, widely, most every culture, most every leader of every culture, it's just not that way, that there's another life, there's an afterlife. And certainly, Christian teaching hits fully the topic of this next life. Listen to what Paul writes here, <clears throat> Timothy. And when you read scriptures, Old and New Testament, you read all about the existence of another life being prepared, but certainly primarily in the writings of Christ and the teachings about Christ. 1 Timothy 4, 7 through 8. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is, some, is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. In other words, learning about God, pleasing God, trusting God, following God. It has value now and for the life to come. There's another life to come. There's something, I can say it this way, there's something beyond the grave. There's something beyond the grave. That's the easiest way to say it. There's something beyond the grave. Philippians 3, 18 through 21. Philippians 3, 18 through 21. A letter written to Christians in this area of Philippi. For as I have often told you, this is Paul speaking, before and now tell you again, even with tears, many leave, live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. In other words, they follow their pleasures. And their glory is their shame. They're proud of their pride. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control that will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. He says, look, this is a place we're just passing through. This ain't home. We ain't home yet. If your home is in California and you stop in uh, Denver, Colorado, you ain't home. That ain't your home. You got to keep going. So that's, that's what Paul says. That's the reality. And it makes sense. I mean, we think about the Egyptians and the Chinese and, and all the other cultures that went before it. There's another life. We have this story. This is one of my favorite stories. Uh, Paul, who was bold, telling about God, telling about Jesus, telling about this, this life to come, telling how you should live this life, preparing for the next life. I say it this way. You should always keep one eye on this earth and one eye on heaven. That's the way to live. That's the best way to live. Not everything's so focused just right now, and not everything's so focused just on heaven. Both. So Paul's uh, getting tried, and he's before this governor called Felix, who's the governor of the Judean region. And here's what he writes. This is the defense he gives. Now listen how straightforward he was about the afterlife, assuming that this governor Felix would understand what he's talking about, that it was just taken for granted, there's another life, right? He didn't have to explain that to him. He had to explain to him that, 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 that this is what I believe that life is. Here's what he says in Acts 24, 14 through 21. Speaking before Felix, the defense, he's in trial. He says, however, I admit 
this is Paul, that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which they call a sect, as a follower of Jesus. That's what Christians were first called. They followed the way, the way of Christ. So let me say it again. However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, a follower of Jesus, which they call a sect. They don't understand what it is yet. He says, I believe everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. All the, the writings of the Old Testament, all the laws that were written and what the prophets all said. He said, I agree with that. And I have the same hope in God that these men themselves have. He's talking about the people that accused him, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day. That there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So he believes there's a God of just, just us. There's a God of justice, that he'll be just. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. After an absence of several years, he says, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to bring present offerings. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. Or those who are here should state what crime they found me in when I stood before the Sanhedrin, which is the ruling council of the Jews. He said, you should bring those people here. I didn't cause any problems. I wasn't doing anything. I was talking about the hope that we had for, righteous and the, for the good and the righteous, for the resurrection of the righteous and the wicked. And then he ends up by saying this. Unless it was the one thing that I shouted as I stood in their presence. And here's what I shouted. It is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I'm trial, that I'm trial before you today. That's why I'm on trial. He says, what I was saying was that you're resurrected in Christ. That your trust in Christ brings you. That it takes care of your wickedness in Christ and your trust in Christ. That's why you have me here today. Not because of some interruption. So Governor Felix had to rule if this guy was a, was a problem or a threat or if he was just talking about his faith. That's where we went. All right. So now as Christians, speaking to all of you who decided to follow Christ, the preeminent authority on the afterlife is obviously Jesus. And he said a lot about heaven and hell. He said a lot about this life, and he said a lot about the next life. Of course, that makes sense. He said a lot about it. So here's some things that I'm not going to read all the verses to you because of time, but I'm just going to tell you a summary of some of the things he said. He talked about heaven and hell. He says in John 14, 2 through 3, which we don't have, that he's going to, to, to be with God to prepare a place for you. So it's a, it's a spot, a place, a good place. It's called heaven. He says, I go to prepare a place for you, meaning the people that have trusted him, followers of the way. He says, if it were not so, I would not have told you so. He says there in Revelation we read, there will be no more sorrow, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. There'd be no more death. All those things that make this world, this life painful. In Christ, when we go to Christ, in God's economy, in God's place, in the place where God resides, where he wants us to reside with him in heaven, there'd be no more of that. No more of the problems that this world offers. The next life will not have that because of what Christ has done for us. It'll be beauty beyond compare. You're talking about a high-def movie. I mean, now you can see, I think the spectrum is, a, there's just a few thousand colors we can see. You can see green, we could name evergreen, we could say light green, we could say lime green. Can you imagine seeing a tree and seeing the leaves on a tree and not seeing four greens, but seeing 40,000 greens? That level of intensity to see an ocean that's not blue, but an ocean that's got a thousand colors of blue and turquoise and white, and you see it all. He says, no eye has seen what God has prepared for those. No ear has heard. We hear some great music. We've heard some great music here. Can you imagine when we hear 10 million angels singing to God? Or even this, the insects, the animals crying out to God, and we understand what they're saying. It says no ears. I mean, the music, I mean, nothing against Kayla, Brent, all the people that are up here today. But you haven't heard anything yet. You guys are awesome. But what we're going to hear in heaven, it is going to be beyond imagination. That's really what it is. No heart has imagined what God has prepared for those. He's made a way for us. Jesus has made a way for us to go back to God and to be with God forever. In this place, this next life, that's forever. Now, that's, that's, 
You should applaud. If you're at home right now, here, at least give me a, just a clap on that. That's, that's a good place to be. So I don't, look, it's not going to be this. I don't know who said that you'd just be in heaven boring with, the, with an angel playing. I, maybe it's some out-of-work musician, but it's just not true, all right? That's not true. That's not the way it's going to be. It's going to be everything that you have that God's gifted you. You'll have perfect gifts in that area and maybe more beyond that. Well, he also talks about another place. And it's not with God. It's without God. And he says it's where sorrow, weeping, and regret are the rule of the day. There will be no community. It will be a place of darkness. I don't know about you. That's why he describes it. You know, when you're in a place of darkness and you can't see people, you can't have community. You can't see them, see how they're, and he says it'll be that kind of a place where there'd be no community. It'd be like the party that you thought you were going to go to, and it was a total dud. It was worse than a dud. It was sad. Whatever happened there, it hurt. It was wrong. You wish you wouldn't have been there. That's what this would be. It'd be the total absence of God. All those good things that I mentioned just won't be in that place. Mark 9 we read about Jesus, and he gives kind of a, a brutal word picture. He doesn't mean it in the literal sense. But he says, look, he says, it'd be better if you had two arms, if one arm was cut off, than if you had two arms and walked into uh, uh, hell with two arms. You'd be better off taking one arm and being maimed going into heaven. He said, so you'd be better off having your body broken and being with God than having everything go right and then march into the next life and being without God. He said, that's, how, that's what Jesus says. Blunt, very straightforward. Terrible place to be. In Matthew 8, Jesus gives this example of called, called a gnashing of the teeth and weeping. He says there'll be a weeping and gnashing of the teeth, but the subjects of the kingdom were thrown into the rubble, he says, into the darkness, where there'll be weeping and gnashing of the teeth. Let me understand that. So they'll be going to a place, and they'll be sad when they got there because they'll be filled with regret. You know what? Here's, can I describe a gnashing of the teeth? Any of you guys gone to the... Uh, Department of Motor Vehicles, or you've tried to go get a license, and you've waited in line for two hours, all right, or an hour, or in the heat, or whatever there was, and you get to the front of the line after waiting an hour or two hours, and the person asks for a, a document or a sheet of paper that you don't have. Now, you're hoping they cut you some slack, but they give you the blank look like, we're open tomorrow, all right, and you go, ah, it's gnashing of the teeth. You go, oh. Oh, why didn't I remember that? Why don't they cut me some slack? Why don't I? That's what gnashing of the teeth is like. Or I'll give you another one. Uh, you left your phone at the restaurant, and the restaurant's two hours away. Ever done that? You're like, oh, ah, it's a regret. Can I go back? Ah. Or the last one I'll give you. You locked your keys in your car. I don't know about you, but I've done that. And every time I do that, I'm going, oh, gosh, I can't believe it. I did that. That's what it was, only worse. So there'd be that frustration. So when you think, well, I just want to go with my buddies and it'd be all-time party, my answer is, that's the word on the street. That people say, well, I don't really want to be around you, you bunch of Christians or, or people like you. I just want to go have a party. The word of the street is going to be a great place. Here's the wrong. The word of the street is wrong. It's wrong. It's not going to be anything like that. It'll be a place where you'll regret and you'll be to the point of tears that this is where you're at, that your sins have been judged by a just God, and you've been found guilty. And, and the, the penalty for that is a separation from God. That's it. Jesus also said this in John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. He says, I'm going to give you, I'm going to say it the way it is. It just has to be said. He said, I'm the only one moral enough to take the wrath, the justice of God on a group of people that deserve judgment. I'm the only one that can take that. And I do that freely because my Father loves you and I love you. He says this in Matthew 17. 13 through 14. This is where the main part of today's message is. This just has to be said. Jesus, his words. He says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. So he says, this gate, this next life that goes into, it's wide. And he says, and many will go into it. And then he says this, but small is the gate 
and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. In other words, the vast majority of the human population will step onto the road that leads to eternal destruction, that leads to eternal uh, movement away from God, and few will find it. Now, that's hard to understand. It's hard to think of, but it's a true statement what Jesus says. It's true. If you found Jesus, if you know who Jesus is, count yourself fortunate because the vast majority of people are never going to accept that or trust in that or go there. I wrote this down. It says it's not that people choose to go to hell. They simply choose the road that leads them there, the wide road that leads to destruction. Little by little, their hearts become hardened to the love of God and their ears become deaf to his callings. If we just do do math today, they say there's two and a half billion Christians on the face of the earth. That's a lot. That's a ton of people that are going to trust Christ and go into heaven. But there's over eight billion people on planet earth. That means there's a ton of people that won't be with God forever. They'll be in that afterlife, that next life that's weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a tough thing. So here's some questions you may have. Certainly, if you're not a Christian yet, these are questions you've asked. And if you're a Christian, I bet you've asked these questions, or you ask these questions now and then right now. I bet somebody's asked you these questions. These are questions, if you're a parent, you're going to have to go over with your kid now and then. It's one that you have to remind yourself of. I have to remind myself of these questions and these answers all the time. How could a good God take nice people and just throw them into hell? I mean, if, if heaven is so great and hell is not so great or is a terrible place where it's just all regret, like, oh, how could a good God do that? Well, then I have to think, give God a little bit more credit than that. Give God a little bit more credit than that. Psalm 103 8 says, the Lord is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in love. I'm going to make a case for this in a second. In the book of Exodus, way back, uh, many thousands of years ago, there was this guy named Pharaoh that God said, I wanted to, Moses came to him and said, I want you to let my people go. And Pharaoh said, no. Well, if I'm God, I just zap him in and that's it, we move on. God gave him 10 amazing chances, 10 no-brainer chances, 10, this had to be the divine one doing this, 10, don't let your heart get hard after it. Ten, they get worse each time. Ten, where no question, this is not a coincidence, this is not science, this is God saying something to Pharaoh, trying to say, I am who I am, trust me, follow me, and all ten times, Pharaoh said no. Even when there was a mouthpiece for God saying, this is of God, here's what he's going to do. Pharaoh's heart was still hardened. This is the God we serve. This is the God we love. He's, he is passionate. He is patient. He is loving. He is calling. He is kind. But he is just and true. It's who he is. In Romans 2, the writer there writes, God's kindness leads us to repentance. In other words, I bet most of you that have followed Christ, you started to realize that you are loved, that there is a God who loves you. And while life can be hard, there is a God who can walk with you through it and pull you through the darkest times. And why God says there will be trouble in this world, he doesn't hold that back in this world. He says, someday I will take away all that in the next one, if you just love me enough to trust my son. That's what he does. It's called the gospel, the good news. But to push you a little bit more, because I don't think you're convinced yet, almost all of you have a sweet Aunt Ethel. She's the sweetest person ever. Might be your grandma, but no, I'm not just use Aunt Ethel. She never heard a flea. She was so kind to everyone. In fact, I would say this. Mother Teresa would look up to your Aunt Ethel. She never said anything. You love it. She always bakes the pie. She's always kind. She's never said a kind, an unkind word to her family. I'm going to give you this, that she is, from a moral perspective, at the top of the human cycle. Now, she's not perfect, and you know that, but yet she is really, really kind. And yet, She's never bent a knee to Jesus. She's never cared about any things of God. And you say, but she's so kind. How could a loving God, how could he send my Aunt Ethel into a place that's not good, that's away from him forever? How could he do that? How could he allow that to happen? 
Well, here's a question that I think God could ask all of us. It's not how, how did you treat necessarily others. I mean, you should treat others good. It's how did Annie Ethel treat God? That's the question. How did she treat God? The creator, the author of life, the one that created this life and the one to come. Well, for all people like Aunt Ethel and like you and like me, he leaves clues everywhere in their life. He wanted to touch her heart just like he's wanted to touch yours. He wanted to have a relationship with her just like he wants to have a relationship with you. And he left clues everywhere. I'll give you a couple examples. At her part where she lived, there was always a beautiful painted sunset sky. Always. So many colors of yellow and orange and, and, and aqua blue that most people, when they'd see that, they'd go, that is amazing. God is an artist. How can he? That looks so beautiful that it's got to be fake, but I know it's real and God made it. And so when she saw it, she just thought, okay, it's beautiful colors. No credit to anything beyond that. Or she heard the singing of the birds chirping, responding to one another, and you thought, how beautiful those sounds. And she just said, it's just birds singing. And while she may have appreciated the sounds, she never gave credit to the beauty of the imagination of the one who created them or how they communicate or the smile of a newborn baby. I mean, you see a little baby. How can a baby at age three or four, five, six weeks smile, a grin from ear to ear, and it's not gas? The kid's actually smiling. She saw that, and she thought, well, babies are nice. But she didn't think about the one who created it, formed it in the mother's womb, and knew that baby before it was even in the mother's womb. None of that. And God had given her literally thousands of moments like this in place after place after place, and not one credit, not one appreciation of the creator God. Well, then there are times in her life where there's crisis, times when money was tight. But all of a sudden, something happened, and it came through. Not one time was there credit to one that stepped into that picture. Never. Or when her kid was in a car accident. And some friends who knew Christ and loved Christ called and said, we're going to pray for your kid. And when they were healed, when they got better, not one credit to God. Or not one time when she knew that there's nothing that she could do for her child, not one time did she appeal to the one who wanted to have a relationship with her. Not one time. When her marriage was a little sideways and her husband wasn't so true, she just hardened her heart a little bit more to life and to God. She was sweet and she was kind. When her friend was very sick, when her best friend was very sick, she never bent the knee to this God who said, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. When she was invited to church, the countless times, when she drove by a church and knew that there were people that were decent, good people that went there, it was never on her agenda to go there. When she was given access to a Bible or given a Bible, she never thought to crack it or look at it or think about it. When there were Christian holidays that were celebrated, whether it be Easter or whether it be Chris, uh, Christmas, she just, those, those, she just thought those were days for the Easter Bunny and for Santa Claus. No thought of, of the greater high of, of God, never once. When there are holy coincidences that most people would say, no way, I cannot believe that this happened this time. This person called me at this time. She never gave any credit to it. It was just a random chance, no matter how ridiculously impossible those odds are. When a Christian said she was praying for her, she politely said thanks, but then thought nothing more about it or cared nothing more about it. When God's spirit tugged at her heart and said, you know you're wrong about this, you know this is what you can work on, you know you should call that, she just blew it off and didn't think about it at all. See, your Aunt Ethel was a sweet, kind person. But she said no to God, not just once. Not just twice. Not ten times like Pharaoh. Not a hundred times. She said no to God a thousand times in her life, over and over and over again, when this God called to her and called out to her and pulled to her. And if you're watching right now online, this is the same God that's calling to you, this Aunt Ethel's God, and you can shrug him and turn him away. I read this from C.S. Lewis, and it's just brilliant. In regards to this type of an Aunt Ethel saying no, sweet and kind, but didn't treat God right. Listen to this. Sin is a human being saying to God throughout life, Go away and leave me alone. 
Hell is God's answer. You may have your wish. In that sense, hell is the ultimate testament to human freedom. See, maybe if you look at heaven and hell and think, all they are is um, resonators of what you want in this life. For those of you that want to spend time with God and know his son Jesus more, God will just resonate that. He will respond that and make that greater. You'll know him completely and fully. And for those that said like Aunt Ethel over and over again, I don't want anything to do with that. I don't want to think about it. I don't care about it. Then God's just going to give you that more and more and resonate that. You'll, you'll hear nothing of God. You'll see nothing of God. Somebody has to say it. Somebody has to say it. Before I get ready to close, I wrote this literally two minutes before I stepped up on stage. And it says, has Jesus just been someone to be used by you or to be trusted by you? I mean, you say you know Jesus, but is it just to, to use him or to trust him and to follow him? Matthew 7, 21 through 23. I guess Jesus had to say it. The words of Jesus. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And the will of the Father is, is that all trust Christ. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name drive out demons? In your name perform many miracles? Didn't we just use you, God? And then he says, then I will tell them plainly. This is the words of Jesus. I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I never knew you. Never knew you. Is, that, is, is this somebody to be used? Or is there somebody to trust? Somebody to trust. I'm so afraid that this generation thinks that Jesus is just a homeboy. Not somebody to be trusted and revered and grateful to. And I guess for every generation I could say that. I don't know why I just picked them out. So I got a challenge to you. As I close. You can do exactly what Jesus asked you to do, which is to put your faith in him as your Lord and your Savior right now. And Ethel, if she was in this room, could come up and after a life of telling Jesus, God, no, 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 thousands of times, she could say just one time, I know who you are and I know you love me. I know there's an afterlife to go into. I trust you. I commit my life to you. I trust that my eternity is going to be secured through what you did, through your sacrifice on the cross. I know that you didn't come to condemn me, but that you came to save me by your work and your life and your death and your resurrection. There's a little tab you have right now if you're watching online. Down at the right side of your screen, it says, I commit my life to Jesus. If this is you, just make this statement, make this step, take this step. All of us that have followed Christ have said that at one time. I commit my life to you, I trust you. This next life, I don't have to build a mausoleum with 5,000 soldiers. I don't have to build pyramids. Uh, I don't have to bribe the gods. I just got to trust you and touch this and trust what you've done for me. And God says, I open heaven to you because of the greatness of my son, Jesus Christ, and what he's done. It's just that simple. Would God's spirit be prompting you right now, maybe in this room, out in the foyer, online, to do that? Now's the time. Just touch that. Make the decision and touch it. Now, here's the challenge. I hope you've done that. I hope you just did it. If you did, then all heaven rejoiced. But I got a challenge now, and I just have to say this. To all the followers of Jesus, I'll give you a little story. Imagine a little boy has a toy. It's a brand new toy. And this toy's a great toy. He's been looking forward to it a long time. And if we could put emotions on this toy, this toy loves him. The toy, the kid opens it, plays with the toy. The toy will only play with this kid for one week. But during this one week, the toy loves him, cares about him, brings him to places, thinks about him. That's what the toy does. But only for one small week, only one small portion of this child's life. Then after that one week, the toy hides in underneath the bed. The toy really doesn't care about the rest of the kid's life. See, that's my concern with some Christ followers. You're so concerned with people's lives right now when it's just a week in a kid's life when eternity is forever that you've never shared 
your story. You've never shared his story. You never asked them out with some intentionality to ask them a question. What do you believe about the next life? You've never shown them the courtesy or the respect or the love of that. You've hid away from your mom and your dad because they grew up with another faith and you didn't want to go there. Is the toy a good toy or a bad toy? Is the toy a loving toy or not a loving toy? The toy is not loving to the child if it won't care about the rest of the child's time. Jesus cared about your life now, but he came to seek and save that which was lost so he could bring it into eternity, the whole rest of time. That's why he came. That's why he came. That's what we're called to do. That's why the church exists. To tell your story, to share your story, to share his word, to pray for people. To maybe give them God's word. So three challenges. Are you using God? Are you trusting God one? Number two, if it's your first time ever, commit your life to this Jesus. Don't go to your grave like Aunt Ethel with a hardened heart. You just got to harden more and more again. Say, God, I want to hear you again. Maybe this week, it's not your time now. Maybe this week it'll be. Maybe this day, maybe this month. And if you're a follower of Christ, I just got to say it. <sighs> Jesus put all of his eggs in your basket. You are the light. You're his light. It's like he took the candle and he said, here, now show people me and follow me with your light. God, I thank you for this series that you're going to put on the hearts of the pastors as we speak to you. God, I thank you for this truth about your son and your love for us and your persistence for us, that you call to us, that we see that you'll knock on the doors of our heart until we take our last breath. And that if we answer that door and trust in your son, you'll come in. God, I thank you for the, the next life, the truth that there is a next life, and it's forever. God, I praise you for Jesus and his great, wonderful life, death, and resurrection that allows us to be with you. God, I pray for all the people that are here today. May this be a day where your spirit touches us more. God, we praise you. We walk out of here boldly, gladly. May this be a time where we know we've been with you. Father, we love you. It's in your son's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Next week, Josh is going to be up, part two. Someone has to say it. See you then.